Hey, it's Joel Duff. Welcome back to the channel. And today I want to talk about Dr. Randy Guliuz's article, Why Biology Needs a Theory of Biological Design, part number four. Randy Guliuz is the, Dr. Guliuz is the president of the Institute for Creation Research, a young earth creation apologetics ministry. And he has been promoting this idea of the theory of biological design. And here he is expressing it in his fourth article, his fourth defense of this. And I thought this was a, a rather uh, comprehensive uh, overview of his ideas. And so I thought it'd be worth spending a little time talking about uh, what he means by the theory of biological design. And what he is proposing here is an engineering-based, organism-focused theory, which is, which he believes, is a superior alternative to Darwinian selectionism. Now, Dr. Guliuza, who is a, who is a professional engineer and also a medical doctor, uh, he aims to initiate at the Institute for Creation Research what he describes as a quote, much overdue conceptual catharsis in biological, in the biological literature, saying he's going to replace evolutionary explanations with what he thinks is an engineering framework. Now, this article is, as I said before, a broader series that is advocating for the theory of biological design, which is rooted in young earth crea a young earth creationist perspective that interprets the Genesis account of creation as a literal historical event. So this perspective obviously challenges the mainstream scientific consensus on evolution and the age of the earth. It proposes instead that organisms were purposefully designed with innate capabilities to adapt to their environments. So what's the purpose of what we're doing here? Well, as a professional biologist myself and a Christian, I'm committed to exploring the intersection of faith and science, just as Randy Gullius is. But with that in mind, this, aim, this review does aim to critically evaluate Guliuz's arguments for replacing Darwinian selectionism with this theory of biological design. You know, by examining the scientific validity of adopting an engineering approach like this to biological systems, I am seeking to assess whether this biological theory or this theory of biological design, can it offer a robust framework that enhances our understanding of biology? Or possibly, does it introduce challenges to established scientific principles and empirical evidence? Well, let's find out. And to do so, I'm going to, first I'm going to have to summarize the main theses and key arguments presented in this article by Randy Guliosa. Right? I'm going to have to provide this foundation for the analysis that I'm going to do. So my goal is to engage thoughtfully in the ideas proposed. I'm going to try to fairly represent Randy Guliosa's ideas as using his words from this article. And then we'll take a look at some of the scientific implications. All right, so what's the main thesis of Randy Guliosa? Well, he asserts that biology requires a new theoretical framework, this thing he calls the theory of biological design. And he thinks that that should adopt an engineering-based, organism-focused perspective. He argues that Darwinian selectionism is saturated with mysticism and relies on unobservable and unquantifiable concepts. And that hinders objective scientific inquiry, in his opinion. So by replacing it with TOBD, this is I'll just shorthand for the theory of biological design, Guliuza believes that biology is going to benefit from like this increased objectivity uh, and a restored appreciation for the creatures themselves and a more accurate understanding of organism environment interactions through what he's going to call internalism. All right. So this whole idea of organismal environmental interactions is going to be really crucial uh, in this discussion. So what are his key arguments? Well, benefit number one in his mind, mysticism is out and he's going to bring back objectivity in science. Guliosa contends that evolutionary biology is replete with mystical explanations and just so stories that employ vague terminology such as selection pressure or random mutations or favored traits. See, he argues that these concepts are absolutely crucial for the evolutionary narrative but he also believes that they lack observable and quantifiable measures and therefore make them unsuitable for objective science. So according to Guliuza, an engineering-based approach would emphasize quantifiable obje objects and have tangible causes. And therefore, that would bring objectivity, precision, clarity to biological explanations. That all sounds like really good stuff, right? All right, what's the second benefit that he sees? Well, he sees a 
a restored appreciation for the creatures of this world. Right? He suggests in this article that Darwinian selectionism devalues organisms by portraying them as somehow incomplete or broken or just vestigial products of random mutations and environmental pressures. Guliaza argues that this perspective negatively influences how people perceive God and perceive life, as if it implies that the creatures, and by extension the, the creator of those creatures, is somehow flawed. And so therefore, by adopting this theory of biological design, which views organisms as purposefully designed and complete in every way, he believes that he can restore a higher appreciation for creatures and their creator, and therefore aligning scientific understanding with a theistic worldview. Now, the third benefit that he mentioned this in this article is what he calls is the accuracy of internalism, which is going to replace externalism. This is probably the more diff probably the, one of the more difficult things to grasp from this particular article. So Guli is a, he's going to advocate for internalism over externalism in explaining biological adaptation. Guliuza says that internalism focuses on innate capabilities and internal mechanisms within organisms that enable them to adapt, whereas he sees externalism at, or externalism attributes as causing changes to external factors which then shape passive organisms. He argues that modern molecular biology supports this internalism by revealing intricate sensors and control systems within organisms that regulate adaption. An engineering-based approach, according to Guliuza, emphasizes the organism as an active problem solver, controlling its relationships with the environment through design features that they've been given. So what's his proposed methodology? How does he propose we ought to go about studying this or understanding this, these design features? Right, Guliuza outlines an internalistic approach grounded in what he thinks are engineering principles. And he proposes the researchers should do the following things. He should, they should approach organisms like they're engineered entities, right? He says we should study and describe organisms in the same way that engineers analyze intricate human design systems that must operate under varying external conditions. He says we got to avoid lots of misleading concepts. Right? He needs, we need to exclude concepts and descriptions that would not apply to engineered systems. Right? What are those you're thinking? Well, such as attributing agency to the environment or using ill-defined terms like mutation load or something like that. Right? We're going to come back to all these things as we analyze what he has said here. But these are, these are the things that he mentions in this article. And he also thinks that we need to recognize nature's impartiality. He says we should acknowledge that nature is a mindless, impartial, and unconscious space, not a living or thinking entity. And I think this is this is maybe at least intuitive, at least coming from uh, what what he would be a theistic uh, um, approach. Right? He says nature's impartial, and it's not a living or thinking entity. And this this all goes to his idea of what he thinks that. Um, evolutionary biologists believe about natural selection that they treat it like it is not impartial, like it is a living, thinking entity that's a conscious thing. It's a force out there. Um, so this internalistic methodology is based on some assumptions, all right? So what, what are his basic assumptions? He thinks there's innate control systems, biological functions that are operating through some identifiable innate information-based, of course, control systems. And that should be the primary focus on causal explanations. Why do organisms change? Why do they appear to adapt to the environment? It's because of these internal control systems that are sensing the environment. All right, second uh, assumption, right? He assumes that the organism is the directing program itself, right? The organism directs all purposeful outcomes can't be reduced below the level of self, the organism as a whole, right? The DNA, the machinery, they're all subsystems within the organism that make up the whole complete organism. And the organism is the director of the entire system. Ah, we'll have to, we'll maybe have to explore that a little bit farther. Um, another assumption that there's goal directed activity, 
organisms or the self, the whole organism has goals, right? A goal-directed activity is expected at every research level reflecting purposeful design. Like the design is that it should serve some purpose, right? And so there is some goal or reason for that organism's existence, goal in the future. It's very different than the evolutionary biology approach uh, to organisms and adaptation. And of course, he thinks there's engineered capabilities, right? He's assuming that organisms have engineered capabilities, right? They have upfront, upfront capabilities that precede environmental challenges, right? Let me, let me really say that again. They have upfront capabilities, engineered capabilities that precede environmental challenges. The environmental challenges, they already have a program in place. They sense that environmental change. They put that program into action, right? Because they've been pre-programmed, right? They've been designed and pre-prepared for future changes. And they're simply responding to the environment with their own programming. That's, that's the internalism, right? Internally, they already have the, necess the necessary things in order to adapt to their environment. Um, he also thinks that traits should determine capabilities and organisms traits determine all of its capabilities and the success in revolving then environmental challenges should be credited to those particular traits what he's trying to do is escape this idea that somehow there's something external that's that's uh influencing the organism um that's all internal that's all um traits that they have that allow them to accomplish uh, the tasks that they need to do Right, and then he also would say that organisms. Um, in this article, he talks about organisms are the ones that define the stimuli. He says that internal programming determines which conditions are stimuli, right? Whether they're favorable or unfavorable, or whether they constant, and and it's those things that determine the niche that the organism lives in. Right, the organism has. I have all these different uh, ability to register stimuli. Some things I I I I think are favorable. Some things I, I observe or I am stimulated that's unfavorable. And I then, like as the entity, right, as the organism, will then find the environment that best fits my particular traits. I'm not letting the environment shape me. I am going to identify the environment and live in the proper niche. Now, some of you might already be recognizing that that's kind of a, it's just a, is there like saying the same thing that, you know, somebody that is uh, going to use a natural selection um, in environment interacting with the traits that they have? It's really not saying anything different. I, Randy Guglielmo thinks he's saying something very different here, but it's really hard to tell the difference sometimes. He thinks that organisms are sensing exposures and they extract data from the environment. He says the environment doesn't send instructions or act as drivers. Right. Again, this idea that he thinks that um, he thinks that uh, other um, evolutionary biologists are somehow personifying or actually believe in the personification of nature as if it's directing, it's causing, it's like has a mind and it's thinking, I want to shape and force this organism to move or change. Um, and he's saying, nope, 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 the environment doesn't send instructions, right? It doesn't act as a driver of change. It's a it's an inert um unthinking just uh it's the environment that's the things out there it's the organism that makes all the decisions he then goes on to say that another assumption is that adaptation is the engineered control of the organism environment relationship by that organism so it's optimizing suitability through innate mechanisms again he just constantly talks about how there's an innate mechanism innate sensor that is going to control this organism environment relationship. And then finally, he says for two entities to work together, each must have engineered systems designed for those interactions. He says cooperation is not a natural occurrence. It can't happen without design. Where it's two things, two organisms in the environment that are, that are cooperating with each other, uh, maybe mutualistic with one another. That mutualism can't come about in any way other than they had to have been designed with the intent that they would be mutualistic, right? They don't. The environment hasn't caused them to come to a mutualistic relationship. They simply are mutualistic because of their preordained nature, because of their design. 
So then Guyasa goes on to use an analogy, which I found very helpful because I've always had difficulty um, sort of getting into the head of or describing what Guyasa really means by some of these terms. I mean, even as I'm, I'm reading his words and trying to express what he is saying in this article, I find myself, you know, kind of confused about it. Um, and if you watch any of my other videos about Guglielsa, I've, I've always been in this little bit of a haze as to exactly what he's looking for. But this analogy clears up a little bit of that. He uses the analogy of the Space Shuttle Columbia disaster to illustrate the importance of focusing on internal traits rather than external factors. He argues that just as engineers would identify design flaws within the shuttle rather than blame the atmosphere, Right? Biologists should focus on organisms' internal mechanisms when explaining adaptation and survival. Right? Saying, look, you know, if you, you, you had this machine that you made, right? You designed, and then something happened to it, right? And it changed. Well, it blew up, right? That's a big change. And that wasn't the fault of the environment. I don't know what he would think if, you know, a lightning bolt hit it or uh, suddenly there was wind shear that they didn't expect. Um, I think he might still say that, well, wind shear that would overcome its natural designed ability to uh, compensate for that. Uh, but still, it's an outside force that then the organism has to interact with, or in this case, the space shuttle would have to interact with. Uh, but analysts, all right, just the simple, I, the simple expression here, he's very much focused on, we would always come back to, as an engineer, the thing we've engineered and see what's wrong with it. We wouldn't ask about the external environment or blame it on the external environment. So to conclude this part, which is, you know, sort of trying to summarize Guglielsa's views from this particular article, um, he's calling for, again, we'll use this, we'll use the words he's using, a conceptual catharsis in biology. He's urging researchers, and of course he's really urging other young earth creationists who kind of aren't really on board with this idea with, that ICR is promoting um, in stupid creation research. Um, and then, of course, he wants everyone in the world to, to acknowledge this as well. But first, kind of needs to get the young earth creationist on board. Um, he wants all researchers to adopt the theory of biological design with these assumptions guiding principles for doing research to achieve what he calls objectivity, accuracy, and clarity in science. He emphasizes that changing the way we look at organisms will lead to a new questions, predictions, and research programs. Ultimately, he thinks that's going to enhance our appreciation for the marvelous engineering of these creatures. And then, of course, an appreciation of the creator who engineered, is the master engineer of these organisms. All right, so let's uh, kind of go back to the top and take a, we'll say, a critical look at some of Guglielmo's statements. Um, what about, let's just start, I guess maybe we should just start with a general overview of the scientific consensus on evolutionary theory or what evolutionary theory is, right? The theory of evolution by natural selection as described, first described by Charles Darwin, uh, in 1859, right? I mean, I think we'd all know that's become a cornerstone of modern biological sciences or for what Randy Gugliosa would say, secular biological sciences. Right. It's just supported by, and I think the consensus view is that it's supported by an extensive body of empir empirical evidence from diverse fields, such as paleontology, you got genetics, biochemistry, ecology, right? A variety of different fields, all looking at different aspects of how organisms uh, adapt and change in this environment, support this basic idea of natural selection uh, and changes in organisms over time. So observations of natural populations as well, fossil records, experimental studies, pretty consistently validated the principles of natural selection and adaptation, right? Natural selection explains the differential survival and reproduction of organisms due to differences in their phenotype. It operates on genetic variation within populations, those things that are able to be inherited. And that leads to evolutionary change or change in characters or allele frequencies of character, you know, the, the things that underlie those characters in, in, uh, in populations over time. Darwinian principles 
have had predictive power in biology. For example, the modern synthesis, integrating Mendelian genetics with natural selection. It offers a comprehensive explanation of how traits are inherited and how populations evolve. So evolutionary theory has guided research for a long time in phylogenetics and conservation biology, developmental biology, all these. That would underscore the real foundational role um, that it has in science today. So Randy Gullios is called a replace Darwinian selectionalism with a theory of biological design, right? I think it's, it, 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 first of all, it overlooks that there's robust empirical support and the explanatory and predictive success of evolutionary theory is, is hard to deny. Although, I mean, certainly Gullios denies that and many young earth creationists would just basically deny the empirical support there is uh, for uh, Darwinian uh, selectionism. So I'll say, while it's essential to always critically evaluate scientific theories, and you could say that Randy Guglia is doing that, he's critically evaluating scientific theories, but any proposed alternative, it's got to be grounded in some empirical evidence and has to dis demonstrate what? It has to demonstrate some superior explanatory power for the mounds of evidence or observations that we've made uh, to this point. Right? It has to bring greater clarity to a large body of evidence, especially a large body of evidence that's integrated across many different fields. All right, so let's see if we can clarify some of these concepts that Guglielmo seems to suggest that his theory better explains. Right, Guglielmo is characterizing evolutionary biology as first thing he does is he says it's saturated with mysticism. Right, he cites terms like selectional pressure and random mutations and favored traits, right? Throws those terms out as if evolutionary biologists just kind of like use those words, but they don't really have definitions and they don't really have empirical support for them, right? He uses those as, he uses them as examples of what he calls ill-defined jargon. Just, they're just jargon. However, I would say these terms have precise definitions within the scientific framework and they're really grounded in observable phenomena. So let's take those three terms he mentioned. Selection pressure. What is that? Selection pressure refers to the environmental factors that influence the reproductive success of individuals with particular phenotypes, right? Selection pressures can be quantified by measuring differential survival of reproductive rates in response to specific environmental variables. Random mutations, right? Mutations are just changes in DNA sequences that occur spontaneously or due to environmental factors. The randomness, though, pertains to the occurrence of the mutations, not to their effects, right? The effects of mutations could be neutral, beneficial, it could be deleterious, but the occurrence of mutations themselves is random, at least most often uh, random appearing. So let's say if I had a I could say if I had this bacteria and it's got a million base pair genome, um, I would have a pretty good idea of how many mutations to expect it to have if it copied itself, right? When I say like maybe it's going to have two mutations or four mutations, uh, maybe you maybe you've measured populations, many populations over many generations, you know what the mutation rate is, uh, and so that's predictable in the sense that I can expect a certain number of mutations each generation. But can I predict exactly where they are? No. I mean, it, 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 they appear random with respect to like where they occur. I can expect a certain number. I just can't predict where those particular ones are. But I can say that depending on where they are, they could be beneficial, neutral, or uh, negative uh, to the organism. So random mutations are not something that is a mystical term that we just sort of like you know, that, that, that there's anything mysterious about it. We've done lots of statistical work and have a lot of information about where mutations occur and what can happen to them. Now, what about this term favored traits? Well, favored traits, those are just refer references to traits that confer a reproductive advantage in a particular given environment, right? and therefore are favored because they increase the frequency of that trait over another trait over many generations, right? And this concept, again, is totally measurable by tracking the allele frequencies in populations over time. So these concepts aren't mystical, right? They're supported by statistical models and empirical data. 
They enable us to formulate hypotheses, design experiments, interpret results within a coherent theoretical framework. Right? The use of statistical models in evolutionary biology allows for the quantification of genetic variation, of selection coefficients, of population dynamics. You know, for example, the, the very famous Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. That provides a mathematical model to study allele frequencies in a non-evolving population. Right? And that serves as a baseline, right? serves as a, as a null hypothesis for detecting evolutionary changes, which would be changes in allele frequencies uh, over time. And we have direct experimental um, studies that have tested these models. Right? So for example, we've got uh, Lenski's long-term E. coli experiment, which has tracked bacterial populations over 70,000 generations. And it demonstrates that adaptation through beneficial mutations uh, occur, and it provides insight into a whole bunch of other evolutionary processes, allowing us to measure them and test them against theoretical uh, concepts and ideas. So really, what's happening here? What's happening here is that scientific discourse often employs metaphors and analogies to simplify complex concepts and to facilitate understanding. Right? Terms like the genetic code, right? the molecular clock, an evolutionary arms race. These are all metaphorical words or terms, but they don't imply mysticism. Right? They're just tools for communication. They're not literal descriptions. Guglielmo's concern about personification in phrases like nature selects, that's something he talks about a lot. Right? How can nature select? Right. Is it, you know, only things that have a mind can like go out and like consciously select something. Right. That just overlooks the recognition within the scientific community that that language is figurative. Scientists understand that natural selection is a process resulting from differential survival and reproduction, not an agent. Right. With intent. It's not natural selection isn't a an agent. Right. Looking to do something. Right? The precision in scientific definitions, right? we have four terms that we use in the scientific field. They ensure clarity despite the use of metaphorical language in order to more simply communicate ideas. So what are some of the other proposed benefits? Right? We said that you know, Ruliosa had all these different benefits of the theory of biological design, presumably benefits over and against uh, the theory of Darwinian selection and more modern views of, of evolutionary theory. So what about objectivity? Right? He's making a big deal about how like, his ideas would be more objective, right? obviously suggesting that natural selection is a subjective uh, approach. So Guglio, he's advocating for adopting these engineering methodologies to bring objectivity and precision to explanations. But while engineering principles can offer valuable insights, I'd say applying them wholesale to biological systems presents some big challenges. For the sake of argument here, I, let's take the secular view that biological organisms are the result of evolutionary processes. Right? They aren't designed artifacts. Well. They exhibit then features that are shaped by natural selection, genetic drift, and other evolutionary mechanisms. Not mystical forces, but mechanisms. They lead to, what does that lead them to? That leads them to complex and often non-optimal solutions compared to engineered designs. You know, because of the randomness of mutation, sometimes they come up with solutions that we wouldn't necessarily come up with. They might be more complex than something that we would that we would naturally design as designers. Biological complexities include things like redundancy, right? uh, robustness, uh, having multiple systems to take care of things, backup systems, right? emergent properties that differ fundamentally from human engineered systems. Um, I'd say engineering approaches typically involve a what top-down design, all right, that has specific goals in mind. You know, this is what I want to accomplish as I begin to engineer, whereas evolutionary theory or evolution operates from sort of a bottom-up, all right? Processes are occurring, natural selection is occurring, mutations are happening, 
genetic drift is happening. I mean, all these different mechanisms we think of that, that uh, are active in the evolutionary processes. Um, they're occurring, right? But without foresight, without uh, a plan, right? They're not thinking. I mean, Gulia's is right. You know, natural selection is not thinking. It doesn't. It's not a force that's saying like, "This is what I want and plan for the future." So this distinction is really a really crucial one in understanding why biological features exist despite appearing suboptimal in form, right? Because they, if they had a foresight, right, they might not go down paths that they were going down, which lead to suboptimal features. You can be suboptimal and still be perfectly successful, right? You don't have to have the perfect characteristics. You just have to have good enough ones in order to survive uh, in the environment. So what about um, complexity in biological organisms? This is something Randy Gugliosa says that his theory can explain, right? Organisms exhibit a level of complexity and adaptability, I'd say, that surpasses engineering systems. For, exist, uh, for example, you have protein folding, you have gene regulation networks, something I'm going to be talking a lot about in the next two weeks in my class. You have complex metabolic pathways that involve intricate interactions many of which we don't even fully understand today. So evolutionary processes have produced really novel solutions through variation and selection over a lot of time, right? A lot of opportunities creating a lot of different variations, right? Which leads to biodiversity and complexity, which to thus far has really not been matched at all by human design. If you're going to apply human engineering principles, well, you're way behind where, where nature is in terms of uh, designing organisms, right? <laughs> Creating complexity. So while engineering analogies, which is what they are really, they can aid in understanding certain aspects of biology, but they can oversimplify and misrepresent the real dynamic and stochastic nature of biological systems. This is what I find often with uh, with engineers that interact with um, biologists in terms of do, working on projects, um, is that they they have a um, with their systems approach they they tend to miss out on the you know they understand that there's variables but they don't understand the sort of the squishiness of a lot of variables that organisms have to deal with um, like just like gene regulation and translation and transcription it's a it's a sloppy process. Um, the way you're usually taught it, it's kind of like this happens and this happens. And the way you regulate it is you can just stop that gene or, or turn on that gene or turn off. It's, it's not off on like a lot of things are and like you'd want in an engineered system. It's, it's often like I want it off, but there's still some leakage that's always happening. It's a very slip, slippery and, oh, I said there's a lot of redundancy, multiple systems, multiple ways to sort of, you know, figure out how to... Uh, solve a problem biologically. Yeah, so Gugliosa, I mean, moving on to some of other Gugliosa's uh, supposed benefits of TOBD, right? He said, suggests it's gonna restore a higher appreciation of creatures and their creator. And while this perspective does align certainly with his theological um, views, I think it also introduces potential biases into his form of scientific inquiry. I mean, he's saying that it's gonna be more objective but um, in a way, he's removing some of the objectivity and certainly introducing another bias. So he'd say like other scientists are biased, but he's introducing his own bias into scientific inquiry, right? Science is seeking to explain natural phenomena through empirical evidence and testable hypotheses that have independent or are, are independent of metaphysical or theological considerations. And if you're appreciating the complexity and the wonder of biological organisms, that doesn't necessarily necessitate, ne necessitate invoking design, right? Evolutionary biology can also provide an explanation for the diversity and complexity of life that's consistent with observations and evidence. And we could appreciate the process of evolution as a process that is also part of God's uh, world. So what about this internalism versus externalism thing? And I think that's just one of the, the biggest um, concepts that uh, Gugliosa is introducing here. But, but still, I will say I'm, I'm still not fully understanding, I think. So Gugliosa, he posits that internal mechanisms 
are the sole driver of adaptation, right? So he's minimizing the role of environmental factors. However, I mean, there's extensive evidence that supports that there's an interplay between internal genetic variation and external environments, right? Or external pressures that, that shape adaptation. I just don't see how he can't see um, the clarity of that evidence from thousands of papers that have been published, right? Environmental factors act as selection agents, right? Not in a mystical sense, not in a like forethought, they're, they're thinking things, right? But they influence what, what genetic variants are going to have a reproductive advantage in that particular environment. So adaptation, it's, it's going to involve both the generation of genetic diversity, right? Got to have diversity. Well, where does that diversity come from? It comes from mutations. And those mutations may be random, which makes them feel unpurposeful, but the environment is going to select those variants. It's not selecting it, again, as if it has a mind, simply what works in this environment. Because of the rules by which this environment functions, certain mutations are going to have an advantage and others will have a disadvantage in that particular environment. Um, they're going to create differential survival of individuals. That's what the environment's going to do, right? The environment is doing something, right? By focusing exclusively on internalism, the theory of biological design overlooks the dynamic relationship between organisms and their environments. This relationship is, it's fundamental to understanding ecological interactions, right? and evolutionary arms races and the ability of populations to change right to changing conditions so what is is this really a feasible explanation for adaptation right while well, internal mechanisms yes they are crucial for adaptation they can't fully explain the process without considering you i mean you just can't explain the process without considering the environmental interactions Genetic variation provides the raw resource, right? It's the raw material for change. But natural selection acts on phenotypes in specific environmental contexts. So what about other things that Guliaza mentions? He loves to talk about things like epigenetics. Well, I mean, epigenetics does illustrate the complexity of gene environment interactions themselves where environmental factors can influence gene expression and phenotype without altering the underlying DNA sequences. I mean, developmental plasticity allows organisms to modify their environment in response to environmental cues. I mean, that's gonna, that highlights the integration of internal and external factors. So this, the environment, it just plays a crucial role in shaping evolutionary trajectories. Environmental changes drive adaptation, speciation, extinction events, Right? For example, the diversification of Darwin's finches on the Galapagos Islands resulted from adaptations to different ecological niches and food sources. And then you have things like the Red Queen hypothesis, which emphasizes the constant evolutionary arms race between organisms and their biotic environments, such as hosts and parasites, in which the host is making changes to try to adapt to the parasite, the parasite's making changes in order to escape the host's changes to defend themselves, right? That's where you get this idea of this arms race where they're both constantly building new weapons in order to try to be able to conquer one another, right? Or defend versus attack, right? And that's each of them is the environment to the other. And therefore those interactions are shaping that particular organism. I think Randy Gould is saying like, no, all the variation was already there. There isn't any new variation. All the programs are there. In fact, there's like all kinds of programs that an organism might not be using. And then when they're in this evolutionary arms race, as you're calling it, that's not really a thing. That's a mystical thing. What it really is, is they all have a bunch of programs. Oh, you use this one. Well, I recognize that. So I'm going to turn this other mechanism I have on and I'm going to do this. Well, you recognize that mechanism. Well, then I'll try this mechanism, but they're all built in, right? And I'm simply sensing that you're attacking me. And then I'm using my pre-designed, pre-made um, systems that God has, the creator has designed in me in order to respond. Not that selection is going to say, out of all these thousands of individuals that are being attacked, 
some of them survive because they happen to have particular variants that allow them to have more offspring or better survive in that particular environment and therefore have more offspring. Um, and it's not that they turn something on, it's just that they happen to inherit a variant that its friend or a neighbor didn't inherit. Um, they don't all have the program, only some of them have the programs necessary to survive in that new environment. So comparing biological organisms to engineered entities, I think it's got limitations. Engineering involves intelligent agents designing systems for specific purposes and with foresight. In contrast, evolution is considered to be an undirected process resulting from natural selection acting on random variations. Now, of course, theistic evolutionary and evolutionary creationists might say that uh, it's an undirected process, at least in terms of what we can observe, right? It has the appearance of being undirected, but you could say that God is still in control of all processes and, and is the author of the process in itself. Um, but nonetheless, you know, it, it would be, the, the contrast here is between Guliuza, who's saying that uh, everything is pre-designed and there really isn't any, there isn't anything new that is ever formed or no organism ever can do anything that it already isn't programmed to do beforehand. And it has no option of actually gaining any new uh, abilities at all, at all over time. So biological systems, I also would say, often exhibit features that we would consider suboptimal, all right, or poor design. Now for Guliuza, he probably says that they only look like that because of genetic entropy, that they were perfect, there wouldn't have been anything suboptimal in the original creation or the original design things, but that design is breaking over time and that leads to the appearance of, of suboptimal uh, conditions. So, but nonetheless, uh, in, in, in a, for, for evolutionary theory, evolutionary theory can explain suboptimal organisms, certainly. It certainly explains poor design, suboptimal systems, uh, just because of the very act of how different systems are formed. All right, so engineering analogies, I think they fail to capture the emergent properties of self-organizing capabilities that living organisms have. Biological organisms aren't just static machines, right, that are just playing out some role. They are dynamic entities, right? They, they reproduce, they can adapt, right? They change their allele frequencies over time. So applying engineering methodologies without accounting for these differences is going to lead to oversimplification or just outright misrepresentation of biological phenomena. I think we see both of these things in what um, Randy Guglielsen and ICR are doing. So what do we have here? I would say in reviewing what Guglielsen's article, Why Biology Needs a Theory of Biological Design, um, it seems clear that the author here is advocating for a real paradigm shift, right? I mean, he's asking for nothing less than the complete abandonment of some of the fundamental assumptions and ideas um, that have are, are behind evolutionary theory. So he's just going to say we need to discard all of Darwinian selectionism, and we need to replace it with this engineered-based, organism-focused theory of biological design. And he thinks that such a shift would eliminate what he perceives as, like well, he just said, this mysticism in evolutionary explanations, which I don't think is mysticism at all. He thinks that this would provide a more accurate internalistic framework for understanding organisms and organism environment interactions. I mean, really, all we have to do is just like dive into those organisms, find the controlling mechanisms, right? Find those programs. And we'd be able to predict, essentially, we should be able to predict what's going to happen to them in the future or what different environments in the future that might arise that they're already adapted to. Um, and so he feels like that's something that we're not, since we're not looking for that, right? There's this whole area of biology of basically future prediction, all right? Understanding what organisms can do that they're not doing now, but they're already programmed to do. So, well, Guliuza's intention to bring objectivity and clarity to biological explanations is, I, I think, understandable. 
Um, this proposed theory of biological design just lacks empirical support, right? It doesn't, you know, sufficiently address the extensive body of evidence supporting evolutionary theory. Um, the analogy of organisms as engineered entities, I think, oversimplifies the complexity and dynamic nature of biological systems. Right? Because I think they're shaped by both genetic variation and environmental interactions. He has no formulas. He doesn't have any, um, you know, a theoretical, I mean, he has a theoretical construct, I guess, but there really isn't any meat to it. Um, there's no empirical evidence that these design features are sitting there waiting, ready to be used in the future. So the integration of, I think, theological perspectives into scientific methodology also raises some concerns about the objectivity and the potential for confirmation bias by those using this theory. And so while faith and science can coexist and inform one another, which I'm, I am more than happy to um, embrace myself, right? I think conflating theological assertions with empirical science can, I mean, it can unnecessarily hinder the advancement of knowledge. So I think science thrives on testable hypotheses, empirical evidence. You got to have an openness to revision. These are all principles that are really essential for its progression. The theory of biological design, um, or really any alternative theory, for it to gain acceptance in the scientific community, it's got to be grounded in empirical evidence. Right? This involves formulating testable hypotheses. You got to conduct rigorous experiments. You have to publish results in peer-reviewed journals, allow your fellow scientists to see that and test your ideas. All right? Without empirical support, these theoretical proposals remain just, they're just speculative and they lack scientific uh, credibility to this point. So I think to conclude, I'll say that while Gugliosa's article represents a viewpoint aimed at trying to reconcile scientific understanding with a particular theological perspective, to this point, it still falls well short of providing an alternative or viable alternative to evolutionary theory. This proposed TOBD lacks an empirical foundation necessary for acceptance within the scientific communities. So as both a scientist and a person of faith, um, I believe that embracing the complexity and wonder of the natural world through the lens of evolutionary biology, to this point, it doesn't diminish, but it can really enhance our appreciation for the creation and the creator, something that Randy Gulliza thinks uh, we need to do. And I agree that... Uh, that um, certain forms of evolutionary or evolutionism do detract from an appreciation of the creator and the creation. All right. I think that's, um, that's enough on, on, on Randy Gugliosa's, um, TOBD. Um, I'm still, as you can see, I'm still struggling to really get a good grip on how he thinks it actually happens. Like how does adaptation actually happen how is it communicated to i mean maybe how does one organism that adapts how is it able to communicate to that to all the other individuals or is it really just that that one individual adapts because it has the right design and then it has more offspring and then more individuals in the next population have that um, every time i start to really think about the nuts and bolts of how this theory would be realized in terms of actual genetic data and following traits and characters from generation to generation, watching how they change. I don't see how he comes up with something that's fundamentally different once he actually looks at data. Because right now it's just a theoretical construct, right? It's a, um, how shall we put it? It's a, um, how shall I put it? It's a concept of an idea. Right. It's like I have I have concepts. Randy Gulliosa has concepts of ideas. Um, but they don't have any flesh and bones on them yet. Uh and so we'll see. You know, his group has supposedly has research projects underway. I've I've talked about one with blood and cavefish, which I think is completely misguided and and sort of misses the point. But it, we'll we'll see what kind of data comes out of that and how they try to explain that within the theory of biological design. Um, but the proof will be in the, the, the evidence, right? The empirical evidence that they produce to support 
their hypothesis. All right, till next time, really, until the next time that Randy Gugliosa makes another attempt to explain the theory of biological design, uh, thanks for hanging with me. Have a great day. We'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.